Okay, so I, I think we can start. So this is software session number two. And uh, I will be chairing this session. Uh, the good news is that uh, our time was extended to two hours. So instead of one hour, we have two hours. So presenters may go as long as they want from what uh, we've seen in session one, your presentations, if you go all, if you tell everything that you have on the slides, we will be just in time and have time for discussions. So um, we will not be limiting your timing this time uh, because to have uh, presentations in 10 minutes, that, that was really tough. And we've seen that. Uh, so uh, I would also like to introduce moderator who will be watching chat, uh, question and answer answers. This is Deirdre Kermis. She is from um, Arizona State University Library and um, so she will be watching uh, the proceedings. And uh, then uh, I will be introducing the presenters and uh, let's start from the beginning. And there is a first um, presentation about um, archive in the box for Dataverse. And this is joint work by Slava Tikhonov, Marian Wittenberg and Wilko Steinhoff from Dan's Kno, Netherlands Archive. Uh, and um, Slava Tikhonov will be presenting his senior information scientist at uh, Dan's and Institute of Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences. So, uh, Slava, the floor is yours. Please mm -hmm. go on. Thank you, Vaidas, and uh, I will try to share my screen. Okay, seems to be working. Can you see something? Yes, 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 yes. Perfect. Okay, great. So uh, now instead of 10 minutes, we'll get 15? 20. 20. Oh, nice. Okay, thank you. So, uh, yeah, so my name is Slava Tikhanov, and uh, as Vida said, I'm from Dance, and uh, Dance is active contributor in Dataverse community. And uh, today I'm going to show you uh, work that we did in Shock Project, and Shock is Social Sciences and Humanities Open Cloud. And we created so called archive in the box that could be installed uh, basically by any uh, data provider or any institution, scientific institution, or any university. And it's all about dataverse and services, shared services. So before I will start, uh, we have this big vision. Uh, we want uh, to run so called data stations, of course, dataverse based. So we want uh, to create data stations for any discipline. and. The way how did we do that, uh, we are basically uh, allowing people to download a distribution that we created with some uh, pre-installed software. And it's basically one liner. It doesn't require any technical skills to get it installed in, in place. And also it could be set up with uh, persistent identifiers or with any customized settings quickly. And uh, people can, can just uh, immediately start to use Dataverse. So uh, as you see on this picture, we have a plan for archaeology and uh, life and life health and medical sciences, physical and technical sciences, humanities. And of course, we already have data personnel uh, service uh, running for, I believe, 15 different partners. And uh, we have projects. So basically, we, we have projects uh, on national level and international. And every project is helping us to innovate quickly. And what we're doing and developing in those projects is becoming part of our infrastructure. And we are also actively uh, collaborating with others and also sharing all, all our developments. So it goes back to Dataverse community and to other communities. So Dataverse, in a way, our key frame framework for open innovation, and this is why we are so keen to support it in, in future. 
So, of course, you can easily understand uh, in the way, uh, uh, in the direction that we have chosen, uh, we can get thousands of installation installations of Dataverse very soon. So let's say if all European countries and uh, countries uh, on all, all continents will install Dataverse, we'll have a lot of Dataverse instances. So we'll basically have uh, we'll have Dataverse network where every specific Dataverse will be kind of considered as, as a node. So uh, we all know that it's kind of challenge to search across of all instances because every instance is uh, customized. It has probably uh, uh, own metadata schemas and uh, uh, they're not, not sharing uh, control vocabularies. So we understand this dream of uh, federated search and universal catalog that everybody has. And we started implementation in, in two directions. So first direction is uh, crosswalks. So we are actively mapping uh, across different metadata schemas. And second is uh, control vocabulary. So basically we are spending a lot of time to implement uh, appropriate support for control vocabularies that could be uh, installed everywhere and people can, can just use control vocabularies from other organizations to link data and to share data and after to make possible for researchers to analyze data. So in, in previous situation, we had kind of centralized approach, like for data personnel, uh, we're running service for uh, a lot of institutions. But in new situation, it will be distributed network of data versus. And basically, we want to link everything using semantic web and link data technologies in the distributed data network. So as probably you know, uh, there is a lot of work that we did uh, on infrastructure level. So we contributed to Dataverse Semantic API, which was developed by uh, Jim Myers and the Global Dataverse Consortium. And also we did a lot of work on, on integration of external control vocabularies. So we did it with uh, Cosmos framework, which was originally developed in Finland, but we promoted it to European level. And now it's kind of a standard package for all control vocabularies in Europe. And basically, we, we got it connected. And after we started to connect other uh, solutions providing control vocabularies. So it's already integrated and available in Dataverse from release uh, 5.7. So what is archived in the box? Here you can see not full list of features that we implemented, but uh, you should understand that uh, we are basically building across of uh, cloud solutions. So we're using Docker as a backbone of our technology. And uh, basically we are also packaging uh, uh, applications in Docker and connecting services, integrating services. And uh, we are um, also exposing uh, Dataverse and uh, archive in the box with Trophic Proxy. And uh, another change that we made, Afrin is managed through uh, in, in one place through environmental file. And we're also uh, able to create different Dataverse distributions uh, with customized services for different use cases and research communities. So uh, yesterday we, we, we had presentation on COVID-19 museum and this is just one of examples how we are uh, uh, using this archive in the box to create really different setup with different shared services. And basically uh, it's incorporating services created in already created in different countries. So external control vocabulary support already mentioned and uh, we are also uh, implementing custom metadata schemas connected to external control vocabularies. We implemented uh, S3 compatible MinIO storage and, uh, of course, data previewers. Uh, we contributed spreadsheet viewer and some other viewers. And we also changed startup process, which managed also in one place now. And also uh, some uh, other interesting functionality like Postgres triggers and uh, our support of um, uh, localization. So we are able also to install a uh, web interface based on, on, on requirements of uh, um, our partners. So I will just dive a little bit in details. So traffic proxy, if you don't know what is traffic, traffic, this is excellent uh, uh, solution. It's cloud native load balancer and uh, it's application proxy service. So it it uh, basically allows to build and integrate any kind of third party services. So let's say if uh, some institution is coming to us and they have uh, own uh, application or own service and they're asking to, to integrate it with Dataverse, this is a quick way 
how we can do that without uh, basically changing maintenance process. So they will run their own service and using traffic rules, we can quickly integrate it inside of archive in the box and we can connect to Dataverse. And uh, from this moment, you'll have complete pipeline working. Also, traffic uh, has uh, SSL um, support, uh, built-in built SSL support. It can, can also generate, let's encrypt certificates and it has excellent uh, uh, incoming HTTPS and TCP uh, request functionality that allows to build uh, cloud solutions and deploy on Kubernetes. Okay, environmental file already mentioned. So we tried to make the process of configuration as easy as possible because, you know, there is quite complicated and, uh, 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 guidelines. So you, you have to read a lot of stuff uh, to, to get possibility to install Dataverse and set up in the way you want. So we just basically put everything in one environmental file and uh, it's uh, all variables um, uh, available in, in uh, the Docker container. And we, we created uh, scripts that are able to read those variables and set up infrastructure. And uh, for example, to set uh, domain names, CDI settings, language of web interface, smell relay, and other uh, stuff. OK, so we are also actively uh, using Docker Compose for single node uh, deployment. and. Uh, the reason for that, because we are involved in so many projects, so we are basically uh, creating uh, customized in infrastructure for any community that can is coming to us. So Docker Compose is excellent way to uh, to develop something, exchange with partner, and they can contribute. And after it's coming back to us, and we can ju just uh, do this process uh, in very quick and uh, efficient way. And uh, Docker Compose has portability and uh, continuous integration and deployment support. And also it's, it has secure internal, internal communication and fast and simple configuration. So if you don't use Docker Sub Compose for now, uh, you should consider to do that. There is also traffic integration uh, with traffic containers. So if here you can see from right side. Another thing I already mentioned, so we have basically started to uh, kind of clone um, uh, the process uh, of Linux, how Linux is doing setup. So we put all uh, startup scripts in, in ED folder. And if you need some custom process to be executed during start, uh, data or startup process, you can just copy this script here and it will be executed and it will do job. So this is a way how you can set up whatever you want. Uh, and uh, this is also very convenient, uh, both for development and production uh, setup. Another thing is cloud storage support. Uh, we implemented MinaYo, and um, MinaYo is open source distributed object storage server. And it's also very efficient and very cool technology that uh, provides S3 interface. And basically it means that uh, you can also turn your own local storage into S3 supported cloud and you can use it. And you can migrate data from one place to another place in, in really uh, quick way. And also uh, MinaYo supports multiple sophisticated service site en encryption schemas to protect data and uh, other standards, so also federated uh, authentication. And basically it allows to build a limited number of distributed uh, mode sets, which is ideal for our um, idea to, to have a distributed network of uh, data sets. Another thing, uh, so another, uh, another application is federated authentication support that uh, we added with Shibboleth and uh, it was implemented, uh, it was uh, implemented in collaboration with Dataverse Norway. They're using this uh, Shibboleth setup to connect to um, own um, provider called Payde. And this is how it looks like in, in Docker uh, Compose. So I already mentioned a little bit about metadata, custom metadata schemas. Uh, so uh, we have a few communities that asking us uh, to provide um, to custom metadata schema, for example, SESDA and SESDA is a community of uh, consortium of data archives here in Europe. And basically we implemented uh, SESDA metadata uh, schema support with external control vocabularies. So here you can see how it works. Uh, also, this is quite interesting integration, and I believe this is kind of uh, growing now. So there is an uh, excellent business intelligence tool called Apache Superset, and uh, 
it does uh, connection to almost any database and posers also is included so basically we did integration of uh, apache superset with dataverse and as soon as it's connected you can get uh, these nice visualizations out of uh, positive database and you can create your own dashboard you can track any information you would like to track and it works basically out of the box so now we are also busy in one of the projects to connect it to um, uh, semantic web solutions that will allow us to show in even more information uh, collected on international level so another solution and uh, this is also kind of mainstream. It's Apache Airflow. It supports uh, uh, Dataverse pipelines. And in few projects, we have uh, uh, demand uh, to build uh, a reliable pipeline that will uh, harvest data from different sources, uh, from different data providers, and will do processing. And after deposited it back in, in uh, Dataverse, and it should track also all changes. So this is a way how to do it uh, in a reliable way. It basically allows you to see uh, the execution of every process and you can see if it's failed and you have to do something or data provider has changed uh, some own uh, interface uh, interface or something has happened in network all of that you can see in dashboard of apache airflow so this is also our recommendation to take a look in this and uh, yesterday I had this uh, presentation about SEMAF, and SEMAF is Semantic Mappings uh, Framework, and uh, it does semantic transformations. And so we created a service that allows us quickly to get input data, uh, do um, transformations on the fly using semantic mappings, and after it just does, does deposit in Dataverse. So this is also integrated uh, in uh, Archive in the Box, and uh, hopefully it will become part of uh, every installation in the world after some time i really believe in semantic solution for everything so to summarize we're building the data world distribution so here you can see uh, some um, notes from wikipedia uh, explaining what what is the data was what is the software distribution so as you can see uh, we have a lot of projects and for every project we are building own customized uh, distribution and we're including their own services uh, and also we have possibility to integrate services from uh, coming from other third parties and this is a way how we can make things much more simple and share between communities so benefits i think are clear as maintenance costs will drop massively as we will reuse the same infrastructure in all of all of the places and it's easy to uh, deploy and uh, easy to maintain and it's distrib distributed and sustainable and it's really suitable for the future because we're trying to put everything in cloud and after some time it will be done automatically uh, the process will be uh, really simplified so you should be able to run your own start your own dataverse instance somewhere in the cloud it will be automatically deployed it will be uh, available and after you should be able to deposit data immediately basically so uh, all these maintenance costs could be relocated to the training and further development of uh, new features and you can use the same infrastructure components to enforce the quality and speed of knowledge exchange and you can also build multidisciplinary teams using the same infrastructure for example you can connect um, uh Jupyter notebooks you can consume data uh, in different formats also we are also working on on support for different communities so you can basically deposit data in dataverse but you can export uh in the uh, in the metadata that uh, some uh, community is expecting from us so this common data infrastructure that we are building uh, should play kind of role of layer of gravitational source for data science and by saying that I'm not kidding because a lot of people now starting to reuse uh, what we are doing in, for their own projects and uh, basically it's all in our benefit because we can get much more data and we can increase quality of this data because data was of course follows uh, fair principles and uh, uh, using shared control vocabularies and uh, other functionality so basically we are uh, building uh, shared uh, services between different communities and dataverse is uh, integration uh, integrated part of it and it will be available in in uh, european open science cloud as a kind of basic solution for uh, data management so um, i just told you a lot of 
about uh, stuff that we are doing and uh, this is final goal uh, we want uh, action to to be delivered uh, as a pipeline as a code and uh, in this pipeline we, we need continuous integration and deployment and this is kind of common thing both for dataverse application and for all services that should should be integrated with dataverse so it should just it should go through this process and uh, it should rebuild docker images it should test applications automatically it should run all these kind of uh, extra checks for quality and after it should update kubernetes deployment so everything should be automated in near future in the european open science cloud and uh, if you're interested uh, there is our github repository and you can check uh, what kind of services we integrated and uh, what we are working on and we're of course continuing uh, trying to continue this work in other projects that i already mentioned and thank you very much and i'm ready for questions Thank you, Slava. Um, so I see there is a question in the chat. And um, Philip Durbin asks, is the Dataverse software already cloud native enough that running it in Docker is easy and straightforward? Or are there changes we should make so that the dataverse is more docker friendly especially in production across upgrades well i would say now it's in kind of in maturity state that everybody can and should use it because we 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 created service for sesda and it's completely automated so it's building from source it's tracking changes in source code it's basically rebuilding an image and this image is uh, being tested and also uh, placed in, in uh, Google repository uh, for Docker and it's being deployed. So I believe that you can just use it uh, as it's kind of ready as a service. Thank you. Are there any questions? I still probably wants to ask question. I see hand. His hand. There's one in the Q and A. Yeah. What were technical reasons you chose Docker Compose rather than Kubernetes? Um, yeah. So the reason, because uh, you know, Kubernetes is really a professional platform. Uh, it's getting a lot of updates, and it's in active development. So it's difficult uh, uh, to find uh, people that know enough about Kubernetes uh, and to do some development. Uh, of our infrastructure and docker compose it's simplified version so it's just one node and basically everybody is using docker compose now in research world and also outside so this is for this reason and uh, i believe that uh, collaboration using docker compose is much more simple than and you don't you don't need any resources you can run docker compose on your own um, laptop and with Kubernetes, you have to install Minikube or something else to be able to run it. Uh, I see more questions. Yes, and uh, Philip Durbin uh, follows on that he meant the core Dataverse code, Dataverse Git repo, not Dataverse Docker Git repo. So, oh, you mean, okay, okay. So, uh, also, uh, Phil, as you know, we are trying to integrate everything that should be integrated in the core inside of Dataverse. However, of course, in the future, uh, we will rely on uh, shared services. So, for example, I see there is uh, also opportunity to, to create service that will do extraction of content immediately after you will upload file. So now Dataverse does this job, and in the future, uh, there are some, some services that could, can do this job and also those services could be shared with Zenodo, with DSpace and other data repositories. So this is the idea of uh, instead of getting everything integrated in one solution and it will be kind of uh, considered as monolith. So probably we, we need to consider a distributed way to run services and uh, different data repositories should be just clients of both services. Okay, I see another question. Phil has his hand up. Oh. 
That was answered already. Um, I, I see a question from Raman. Hi, Raman. Long time ago. Uh, thanks, Slava. Can you talk about difference between uh, your use of Docker Compose vs Kubernetes? Oh, you, uh, Docker Compose used for testing and uh, yeah. So this is exactly the idea. So production should be cloud-based and, and should be deployed on Kubernetes and all development should be done with Docker Compose because this is the simplest way to exchange source code and uh, redeploy the same infrastructure on another laptop. Okay, another question. Uh, another question. Would you provide advice on DB maintenance for folks that are not experts? Okay, so I think you should listen next talk because uh, we'll, we'll have LAP from, from Portugal and they actually did a lot of uh, stuff on, on database maintenance and uh, they created a POSIS cluster, I believe. And um, yeah, probably next talk will be more suitable. Uh, Phil, I'm just thinking that we will welcome pull request to the core data score to make it easier to run in Docker Kubernetes. Uh, yeah, why not, Phil? I don't see any complications about that. I see Philip is raising his hand. Uh... Oh yeah, maybe I'll just unmute. Thank you, Slava, for answering all my <laughs> questions. I guess um, just to give a little context, at Harvard, we don't, well, I mean, Harvard's a big place, but IQSS um, in Dataverse land, we don't use Docker or Kubernetes very much. Um, uh, so uh, we have a lot to learn from people like you or Oliver. And um, I, I worked a little bit with Red Hat on getting Dataverse to run on, on OpenShift, which is their flavor of Kubernetes. And they, they kind of looked at Dataverse and were sort of like, well, this really wasn't built to run in containers. And like, it's weird that you have to run the installer like after the the node is, is booted up and stuff. So I think from that experience, I'm just sort of a, I think I'm aware that um, there are probably things we could do. Like if we were to start Dataverse today in 2022, and I think we would build it from the start to be more cloud native. So um, I think we can get there. It's just gonna take some time and pull requests and, and ideas from people that are actually using Docker and Kubernetes and stuff like that. Uh, in production. So th that's my main point is that that we're learning from you guys. Thank you. Uh, please keep telling us how to make it better. <laughs> okay, no problem. And uh, again, I um, already mentioned about European Open Science Cloud uh, EOSC and basically the policy for the future for Horizon 2020 projects that everything should be uh, dockerized and should be deployed in, on Kubernetes to make it reusable and uh, we'll prevent people just to reinvent things because there are some services that already exist and uh, in good maturity state that people can can just reuse. So this is the idea. And also we, we can connect other services, like already mentioned a few times, very quickly by using uh, cloud native solutions like traffic. So this is where you should really consider integration with third party services that can do some job uh, like content extraction is better. Okay. <laughs> okay, so now we'll consider this. <laughs> okay. So so. First, uh, Sonia, first I will finish my job in Europe and after I will come, okay? Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, thank you, Slava. I think we have to move on with other presentations. And I would like to invite uh, Zacharias Benta. Uh, he is uh, Linux System Administration at uh, LIP University Minho. Um, he graduated from University of Minho as a Master in Engineering of Computer Networks and Telema Telematic Services. And uh, he has passion for technology, loves to experiment, and um, he will be presenting joint work with Jorge Gomez, Maria David, João Pina, Cesar Ferreira, João Cardoso, Filipa Pereira. I hope I pronounced everything correctly. 
and presentation is about developing a distributed and fault tolerant dataverse architecture. So Zaharia's floor is yours. Okay, thanks for the presentation. Um, so we're here presenting um, our, our work. We, we tried to develop a distributed and fault tolerant. Let me take this out of here. Um, uh, and, to and fault tolerant uh, dataverse architecture. Uh, we're a group of seven people, but as I've mentioned in the previous session, we should be eight people because Slava was also uh, very helpful um, with with our with our work. We are always always giving a, a few a few tips and, and advice on how to do some 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 things. Um, so what, what? Who are we? Who are we? We were INCD, the Portuguese National Distributed Computing Infrastructure. Uh, we provide cloud computing services, high performance computing, and high throughput computing to all research and academia institutions in, in the country. Um, and we had um, one problem: we wanted to deploy a dataverse service for the National Scientific Compu Computation Foundation. Um, we had to make it fault tolerant. We had to, we, we couldn't have any single point of failure and it would have to be highly available. So what were our main issues? We had no recipe to elaborate on. Um, the Dataverse uh, documentation states that there's an advanced installation, but it doesn't elaborate a little bit on it. Just gives you a, a nice um, architecture picture, but there's actually no 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 information on how to do it. So we had to deliver uh, to create our own recipe. Uh, we also had a few trial and error uh, package installations, uh, but they were not flexible enough. Uh, we used the um, uh, danceable scripts to, to 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 install Dataverse, but they were not flexible enough. Um, if, we, if we wanted to make a, an upgrade or things like that. Um, also, uh, expandable storage. We didn't know which was the best way to go. If we'd go S3, local storage, uh, we pondered on using local st storage, but then we would be limited to the local, to the, the total amount of storage that we would give it in the first place, and then we could not expand on it. Uh, regarding solar, we didn't know if we could do it a standalone installation or a distributed installation, so it was um, quite a tricky, a tricky thing. Um, we also wanted to have a distributed database, um, and we had to, to figure out a way of uh, solving that issue. Um, also, if we wanted to to make it fault tolerant and um, highly available, we have to we had to have a lot of um, probably more than one server, and then we had to have some way of uh, shifting the roles between the servers if some um, something would happen to the the, the primary machine. Um, so our drawbacks were that we had to do a lot of trial and error advanced installations, and we came to the conclusion that 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 was not the way to go. Uh, the best way to go was to docker everything. Uh, and then here we stand on the shoulders of giants like Slava and his team because we used the the recipe his recipe, but it still wasn't uh, the 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 thing that we needed. It was not what we intended. Um, we wanted to go a little bit further. Um, and then we also, we also had to um, we had some some trial and error um, uh, trial and error uh, configurations with direct upload with S3 and Swift. Uh, so we 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 tried it and it didn't work a little bit as we as we expected uh, because of the the, the MD5 some part it would crash sometimes it would have to, we would have timeouts and. We scrapped that part. Um, solar index dis, uh, dis, uh, distribution, distribution uh, distributed implementation of solar index was quite difficult to do. We didn't have any know how to, on how to do it, so um, we had to to also skip that one. Uh, Postgres documentation was lacking 
solutions for 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 a distributed um, Postgres cluster. Um, it was really really hard to figure out how we could have uh, a primary server and then two secondary servers, and then if the primary server would crash, how would we shift the roles from the the the, the secondary to, be, to turn the secondary server into a primary and then if we, if the, the 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 machine that crashed came came to life again how could we recover that machine and make it primary again um postgres documentation was really really lacking we we came across a few videos uh, from from the guys uh, from postgres even even one of the the employees uh, was uh, of postgres uh, was stating that um Good luck trying to find a solution for this uh, because there is none. Um, and we 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 crawled the web for 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 a solution and and found one. Um, and the, the server's role shifting also demanded some uh, human intervention, and we didn't want to do that. We wanted everything to be automatically logged, like a like a friend of mine usually says. Um, so um, our solutions was were to, to to create our own recipe and uh, and with, with with some 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 pipelines uh we we created a, we create a, we were using docker containers for everything it's quite easier to maintain and uh, redeploy uh, um, a new machine uh, for the storage we are using minio um we're using a standalone solar uh, ser server um the solar index and for the database, we are using PG Auto Failover, which is an extension that a group called Situs Data created, which allows us to have a database cluster, a Postgres database cluster, which is fault tolerant and is fully synchronizable between all the nodes. Uh, it's quite, quite good. We, 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 we hammered the, the heck out of it, and we tried the very, very uh, a lot of uh, different configurations, trying to shut down machines and then uh, turning them back on and pl pulling the plug on them, and it works like a charm. It works really, really, really good. And we're also using Keep Alive and VIP uh, virtual IPs um, to 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 grant the, the, the specific IPs on our cl cloud infrastructure to the machines that are the, the, the masters and, the, and, the, and the, the secondary machines. Um, we created a, a pipeline on GitLab, uh, which allows us to manipulate all the, um, all the, the, the infrastructure. Uh, we have some service set up. We can destroy, we can restart any of the, the machines that we have. We can check the services status. And then here we have a little bit of disaster recovery stuff where we can drop some nodes, promote some nodes, and shift the, the, the roles between, between all the nodes. All of this to have this final architecture where we have um, all our uh, Docker files and uh, environment variables and all that stuff on GitLab. Um, and then we use our pipelines, GitLab pipelines, to deploy it on OpenStack. So in OpenStack, we have uh, the following architecture. Uh, we have a primary Dataverse uh, server, which has, which has the full um, stack on it. It has the Dataverse software. It has the Postgres database. It has a solar index um, service, and it also has uh, an Nginx, which is used as a proxy for for our we 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 opted for nginx and not for traffic as slava used in his archive in a box solution um these are all um docker uh, docker um, images that are running on the, um, every every machine um and then we have this um a mirror of this machine here we have we're using minio this is a virtual machine created in openstack which is running uh minio and then we have two monitor nodes the monitor node the primary one and the secondary one this is to to have a full redundancy of the services um the the we we have a, a monitor a monitor machine which is um um, uh, a database uh, Postgres uh, server, 
which synchronizes all of these ones, all of, all of these that are distributed through all the, the machines. Whenever you write something to this one, all the data is replicated to all these uh, servers. So if something happens, for example, to, to this data database service, the monitor orchestrates uh, the 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 orchestrates all all the, the, the communication between the the nodes. And if something happens to this, this one is um, eliminated from the, the cluster. And then we can uh, create um, an, an, a sort of, a, of an election and from both of these guys, they have a, different priorities and then we can promote one of them to the primary server. Um, all of this is monitored through Nagios. Uh, Managios as an event handler, which which is monitoring the status of this primary machine. If something happens to this machine, it triggers um, a few scripts that call a Python script, which interacts with the GitLab API, and then runs those pipelines that I've shown you before. Uh, it shifts roles. It's it's uh, if this machine goes down, it will shift roles to the Postgres servers. And make this one the the, the primary uh, database uh, server, and then shifts this machine to primary database instance, giving it the correct IP address, so it could it could connect it could be connected through uh, to uh, through the um, through the the web interface of uh, OpenStack. Uh, we haven't yet uh, found a solution to MinIO. Probably we will scale this uh, horizontally and make it um uh create a, a cluster that's uh, for, for 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 the future and this is what i wanted to present thank you very much and now if you guys have any have any questions um there's one you. question from yep. esther why finally standalone solar instead of a distributed one yeah because we tried we tried doing it and since we had no we had no um no no real real background on on it um I, I forgot i forgot to mention that uh, whenever one of our machines um sorry let me let me go back here and go here share this uh whenever we have uh whenever we have a, a crash this solar uh, index it's uh, it's standalone but we re-index it and it reads data from the database and everything works perfectly we tried deploying it make it a uh, distributed um, uh, cluster. But when we, like I said, we didn't have enough knowledge to this because we had to upload a new schema. And then when this machine crashed, it would not, uh, it would not uh, turn this machine into the, the primary uh, solar index machine. And we had a lot of issues with that. So we skipped that part and saw that if we had the standalone solar, and then we just re told it to re-index all the data from the dataverse, it would, it would just work and um and that's it <laughs> if there's any any other uh, which uh, you might you. be interested in the store presentation the other session uh, okay okay there are quite a few comments by oliver Berto. uh you can see that in the chat i put it mm -hmm. on the notes so um, okay. there aren't many okay. things mentioned. So I think uh, that would be there's useful. Also, there's one question here in the Q and A um, from Jose. Just to be sure, only one Dataverse instance is serving content. Correct. The second node is for reliability. Exactly. That's it. Only one machine is uh, available. Uh, is, is providing the, the the content. We are not having uh, load balancing or something like that. You can get. You guys could also. Uh, Ask us if why not Kubernetes? Why not? Because because this project started in OpenStack when we didn't have any know-how regarding uh, Kubernetes, and then we skipped that part. And maybe in the future we could elaborate on this one because probably Kubernetes would also solve all, all some of some, most of the issues that we we found. I don't know if. Uh, that was the, the answer you wanted to hear. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. 
Okay, anything else? Um, okay, so some other comments. Okay, so thank you, Zacharias. Uh, then we can proceed to another presentation. And um, here I would like to invite Esther Zale Yeuma, if I pronounce it correctly, uh, who will be presenting their uh, collaborative job with Thomas Junot from Institutional to National Dataverse Repository, Challenges and Opportunities. So, um, Esther, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you hear me and can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, Could you please uh, make it... Um, Yes. Is it okay? Yeah, perfect, perfect. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, I have to thank very much the, the, the two first uh, presenters because um, the job you have done will be very useful to us. <laughs> so uh, I'm delighted to present you um, this project, uh, which is a national initiative um, that aims to provide um, a national data repository um, for uh, research data in France. Uh, oh. Well, yeah, okay. So uh, the project is um, a realization of one of uh, the actions of um, the second national action plan uh, for uh, research data in France. So it's um, um, something um, strategic and um, at the national level. Um, the objective, as I said, uh, is to provide um, a national repository. Uh, but also uh, to uh, provide um, supporting services uh, to the researchers. So uh, we have two dimensions uh, in the, the, the whole project, uh, a technical dimension, um, which um, is led by my team and me, um, and uh, the supporting uh, dimension, um, which means to organize uh, at the national level uh, some uh, teams, collaborative teams to support the researchers and also to uh, share some common practices in terms of uh, creation, data creation. Uh, we skip that. Um, so, uh, the technical part uh, consists in two modules, uh, the repository and uh, the catalog modules. And um, hopefully we will achieve these two uh, objectives uh, through uh, Dataverse. Um, it's a collaborative project uh, led by INRAE, where I'm from. Uh, but uh, as you can see, there are many universities and um, research organizations uh, in included in the, the project. Uh, we started last, last year um, in September, and it's a, a three-year uh, project. And um, at the end of the day, um, in addition to um, the tools, we would like to have um, the governance and uh, uh, um, um, how to say a, 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 a team that will um, uh, take care of all the, the tools and services uh, for the coming years. Um, 
So I will keep this part. Um, I wanted to uh, focus a little bit on uh, the, the, the architecture we, we are trying to build um, because um, we have many uh, potential use cases, uh, including more or less sensitive data also. And um, as you can see, the data uh, and the users will be uh, from different organizations, uh, different universities and research organizations. So we have uh, quite the same uh, issues and same uh, drawbacks that Zacharias presented. So uh, our main principles in, in terms of uh, target, our target architecture uh, will uh, be to have something uh, really um, operational. I, 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 I hope it's um, I, I well translated <laughs> uh, this one. Uh, we, we will have to um, have different levels of uh, security. Uh, we want to opt optimize uh, the cost. And uh, we uh, also have a, re a reliability uh, issue, performance issue. And um, we will have to uh, uh, govern all this uh, collaboratively. So, um, We are aiming to uh, an architecture uh, which will be uh, based on uh, different data centers. Uh, I don't know if you can uh, really read this one, um, but basically uh, we will, uh, we want to uh, be able to deploy uh, different instances uh, across uh, the, the data centers of uh, the, part, the, part, the partners. Uh, so to um, have um, a distributed um, installation of Dataverse. Uh, and we, we want also to be able to, uh, to base on um, public, cloud and um, uh, regarding the storage we want to uh, uh, to um, have all the data uh, distributed uh, through um, um, a, um, a community cloud uh, of our higher education um, organizations, uh, data centers. Uh, so uh, this is not uh, really uh, deployed. It's a work on progress, but uh, I wanted just to um, show you uh, the complexity of um, the architecture uh, we need to, to uh, build because um, we don't have to to have one single uh, failure point. We want high availability, <coughs> sorry. And um, um, as I said, uh, we want to deal with different uh, levels of security. So um, yeah, we will be able to uh, come back to you next time and and tell you if we manage to deploy uh, this architecture and how we uh, um, we manage to uh, exploit it and to govern it. Um, yeah, regarding the storage, uh, uh, right now we have um, the data that are stored uh, into. Um, a data center, a first data center and replicated in a second one. And um, we have also um, uh, some backups uh, in a third uh, data center. 
And what we also tested and want to uh, uh, implement uh, for um, the national uh, uh, repository is to um, link each uh, um, dataverse that is created for uh, an organization to uh, S3 uh, bucket. Uh, we are using, um, in my institution, we are using uh, SF storage, um, but uh, we have tested with um, other uh, S3 uh, compatible storage and um, um, it works. And this is the model we want to uh, have for um, the national um, repository. Um, other challenges uh, we have to deal uh, with, um, some are um, already uh, okay. Uh, is uh, to the, 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 the challenges are um, um, concerned first uh, the authentication and user permission uh, because uh, we will have uh, different organizations in included in the project. Um, the scaling issues. Um, in terms of uh, storage, uh, mainly. So hopefully uh, the, the use of different um, S3 buckets uh, through uh, the institutions, uh, data centers will also uh, help us to be more agile uh, in scaling um, in terms of storage. And um, yeah, uh, we, uh, we want to uh, aim to a, a court trust seal certification. So um, it will be a challenge to kind of harmonize uh, the curation practices uh, throughout different uh, organizations and different types of data. So uh, to, uh, to meet, so to meet the, um, the criteria of uh, core trust seal uh, certification. And uh, we would like to, uh, of course, empower uh, the user support for and in um, different uh, organizations and uh, disciplinary uh, communities. So, um, I think the, I believe the um, one key for us will be to uh, really engage uh, our community. Uh, so we are preparing some tools, uh, for example, a, a charter for uh, the Dataverse collection administrators and the data curators. Um, we tried to, um, write a convention uh, in order to uh, really uh, share the responsibilities uh, uh, among uh, the different uh, institutions. And uh, we are also organizing uh, local support centers in order to uh, help uh, locally um, the users, the community, the communities, the uh, the researchers, uh, so uh, we can have a really um, qualitative uh, metadata and data uh, in the repository. Um, thank you, that's all. <laughs> thank you, Esther. I um, don't see any questions neither in the chat nor question and answers no hands raised i just uh, then myself would like to clarify so we are deploying um, this governmental data on dataverse 
infrastructure. Am I correct? Yes, sorry, my microphone was muted. Yes, it's correct. And uh, how the data is uh, imported into Dataverse because governmental data, they are like big, big uh, data. No, it, it's, it's, um, it's uh, research data only for research ah, data okay. only. It's not for all. We have another repository for gov governmental data. Uh, this is a, a national uh, repository for uh, research data. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Mm. Sorry if it is, it was not clear. Yeah. Okay. So there are some other congratulations in the chat um if there are no other questions then um i will proceed with uh, inviting um, three other presenters ellen krafmiller raman prasad and ethan coven uh, they will be presenting on um, dp creator from the OpenDB project and Dataverse. Uh, so um, please, the floor is yours. I know that you will be showing some movies to us today. Great. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. And just, just uh, Esther, could you stop sharing the slides? OK, thank you. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Ethan Cowan, and along with my colleagues, um, Ellen and Raman, we will be presenting a DP Creator and Dataverse, Integrating Differential Privacy. A bit about OpenDP, which is short for Open Differential Privacy. This is a large community effort, um, which is developing open source tools for differential privacy. You can see on, right, on the right, our executive committee led by Dr. Gary King and Dr. Salila Vadhan. And we are focused again on developing open source tools for differential privacy. A quick summary of what I'll be covering today. This is uh, you know, a, a real world example of what differential privacy is. This is a dataverse restricted use case, which is when data is hard to share. We will be talking about the DP Creator application that we've been working on. We will provide a demo of the DP Creator application. We will talk about the benefits and the summary of the project. So to begin, um, let's consider an example of differential or an example of a privacy violation rather. So consider you're in a class with five students total. The teacher writes the average exam score on the board. It says 85%. Just as you see this, your friend sends you a text message that says he's joined the circus and he's dropping the class. You inform the teacher of this and the, the teacher recalculates the average exam score and writes 84% on the board and crosses out 85%. The question is, has your friend's privacy been violated? So let's look at the math here. Uh, for each of the five students, we have Q, R, S, T, and X as their scores. And just using the uh, definition of mean, we can do uh, the mean before your friend dropped the class is the sum of Q, R, S, T, and X divided by five. And we know that that's 85 based on what was written on the board. And similarly, where X is your friend who dropped, if we remove X from the equation, we know that the average of the four exam scores after your friend left was 84. So we have QRST all over four equals 84. So what we've got here now is an equation with one unknown and we can actually, we can actually solve it. So multiplying through by five and four in each line, we end up with the following of 425 and 336. And then subtracting those two equations from each other, we can solve for X and we find that X is 89. So what just happened here? It, it turns out that by um, it turns out that by releasing the mean before your friend dropped and the mean after your friend dropped, the teacher has actually um, indirectly given us your friend's exam score. 
So in conclusion, the, the, in bold, the most important thing to take away from this is that releasing statistics can tell us information about individuals. One way to mitigate this is to add noise, and this is a common differential privacy technique. So if you consider the same scenario, but the teacher added noise sampled from some statistical distribution, both uh, uh, before and after your friend dropped, then you end up with this equation where instead of just having you know, these neat numbers, 85 and 84 and one unknown of X, you end up with something where you have a true mean and you have a noise value, but you don't know what the noise value is because it was sampled from a distribution, it could really be anything. So instead you end up with a scenario where you have you know, Y plus noise or Z plus noise. You, you can no longer solve this equation with one unknown. You have too many unknowns and not enough uh, equations. So in this case, you know, privacy can be preserved by adding random noise to your statistical release. And I'm gonna pass the floor to Raman. Let me unmute there. Hey, thanks a lot, Ethan. So I'm going to describe how the statistics with added noise in the classroom example, the statistics that can't be reverse engineered may be used for uh, restricted data versus data sets and also how DP Creator can help you generate them. As, uh, as Dataverse users, you know, we know that public data is a, is a pleasant experience. It's kind of like window shopping. You can look at the rich metadata, you can uh, preview the data, and you can even download the entire file. However, for restricted data, it's kind of like walking by, you know, a shop where the, where the windows uh, are opaque. You know, you can't learn much more than the name, size, and file type. Then if you want to know more, you have to face the bureaucratic work of uh, requesting full data access, even learn if the data is usable. And, you know, that pressing that request access button can take, you know, hours or in, in some cases, many weeks as you have to fill out various forms. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is where differential privacy can come to the rescue. Um, so differential privacy actually isn't a library or an algorithm. It's a mathematical definition. And you basically, you know, when you look at resulting statistics, the, the idea is you can't tell whether any one individual's data was included in that statistic. And it's... Um, it sounds great, right? It's, it's, you get statistics that are accurate enough to understand the data. They're precise enough to make decisions, including like policy decisions, like the census is using this now. And, but they're still noisy enough to protect individual privacy. So it's, it's in a way, like if you look at the, the image on the lower left, it's like a better window shopping for restricted data sets. So uh, it, it, and if, if bonus points later, if anyone recognizes the picture on the lower right. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, so basically different, so lots of, I just want to mention that, you know, it's, this is not like a, a research project anymore, you know, for many years it was, but now lots of organizations use differential privacy. So if you use iMessage or FaceTime on, on like a, on an iPhone, differential privacy is used to protect your identity. If you work with a uh, Windows OS, the machine is always sending back information about the, the hardware itself. Uh, back to Microsoft, but again, differential privacy is used to protect your identity. So these companies can kind of do their work without, you know, um, without knowing or tracking you as an individual. And now the U.S. Census is heavily using differential privacy. And uh, we'll put this link in the notes, but we encourage you to look at this uh, differential privacy press kit from the census. It has a couple of uh, short video introductions, as long as as well as more in-depth information. Uh, so. Uh, that, yeah. So, uh, so I guess what, what's the catch? You know, differential privacy is, is really tough to do. So I mentioned like the census and Microsoft and, and um, you know, all the big techs, they kind of, they have teams that can, that can uh, make differentially private libraries, but most software companies and, and most, you know, and definitely, you know, regular programmers don't have that level of skill and ability. So the OpenDP project kind of brought together experts in the field, you know, some of the people who made differential privacy, including um, Professor Dworkin at CES, they, they're, they're here. And then we've kind of teamed up with, with some really good engineers who made like an OpenDP library. And so, so the, but the question, but OpenDP is, is still kind of hard. And, and the question is, you know, how does uh, Dataverse access differential privacy? 
So you can see on this diagram, like you take a sensitive data set, which is your dataverse sensitive data set, and you kind of uh, fill out these privacy parameters. And this is this is pretty tricky. And then you kind of, and then you use OpenDB library, which is available as, as Python, and you create some statistics. But it's still hard. You still need expert knowledge. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll just hit the top bullet points here. So we kind of wrapped up the process in the previous slide into an application, which is a, a guided experience for curators and subject matter experts. So you, you need to know a little bit about differential privacy, but you don't need programming. And since you know your own data, you will, you'll be able to answer the, the questions that the application presents. So it's really a curated way of using the OpenDP library underneath. And it connects to uh, Dataverse repositories. Uh, next slide. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm, I won't go through this entire slide, but it's just showing that you know, from the Dataverse repository, you can launch the DP Creator application. And one thing it does right now, which we, we'd invite people to talk to us during the Q&A section, is a D, the DP Creator application copies your private data set temporarily. And, and once your statistics are constructed and uh, what we're calling a differentially private release is made, and deposit back to Dataverse, we, we delete this temporary copy. We just want to let you know that's our current kind of state of application, but we're exploring different ways to, to potentially not touch the data in that, in that sense. And you can also see from these, uh, these green boxes that once your, your differentially private release is actually considered public data. So, you know, as well as back on Dataverse, as well as like, a, you know, a name and a file type, your, your sensitive data can also include like these uh, differentially private statistics for your users to get more information. Uh, next slide. And actually I'm gonna turn it over to Ellen now, who's gonna give a uh, short demonstration. And I just wanna note that we, we geared everything to try to stuff it into, into 10 minutes or so. So uh, you, uh, if, you have, if you have questions along the way, please, please let us know. Thanks. Okay, thanks Raman. Um, so um, now what I'm going to do is uh, show you a demo um, of DB Creator integrated with Dataverse. And what this is, is um, DB Creator uh, configured as an external tool in Dataverse. And we're going to walk through the workflow of a data owner or curator creating a differentially private statistic for their private data. So to start it off, from uh, Dataverse, you can invoke DP Creator. And then you know, the homepage has some introductory information. And from here, you either log in or create your account in DP Creator. And then once you do that, you get to this main data page. And you can see here that um, this information from Dataverse about your data file has been um, transferred over to DB Creator. Um, so this is the file we're working on. This is the Dataverse it came from. And from here, you can step through a multi-step process where you provide information about your data set that is um, used to create your DP statistic. So um, on the first page, we answer, ask some questions just to make sure that your data set is appropriate for uh, differential privacy. So we wanna make sure that this is actually um, private data about individuals and that um, each individual pairs in one row. And we also ask you um, how, how much harm would be caused by disclosing your data. And we use that to determine your privacy budget for your differential, uh, differential private <laughs> statistic. So after we've done that, then the next page um, is where we um, choose the variable that we're gonna create our D DP statistic from. So you can see here that all the um, variables from our data set have been read into DB Creator. In this example, we're gonna choose age and add a min and max for age. And then on this page, we answer some more questions about the size of the data set. 
whether it's from a random sample and whether the size of the data set can be disclosed. And that information is also input into the algorithm and it affects your privacy budget, how your privacy budget is used and the amount of accuracy in your DP statistic. And now on this page, we um, decide what DP statistic we wanna create. So you can see there's, uh, we have different options of statistics that we can create. And in this example, we're gonna choose mean of age um, with our default value for missing data. And you can create multiple statistics, but in this quick example, we're just doing one. And here is a summary of all the statistics you wanted to create. Here we just have one. And now is when you submit. And when you submit, what's happening is your DP statistic is being calculated and um, a PDF in JSON containing the information, the DP statistic and all the uh, supporting information is being created and deposited back into your Dataverse. So when that's completed, you can see um, that the PDF is available within DP Creator, and it's also available for download in DP Creator, as well as the JSON file. And if you go back to Dataverse, you can see that um, the DP files have been added as auxiliary files in your data set. So if you go under auxiliary files, you can see both the PDF and the JSON available. And then, to see exactly what's in the PDF, um, you have the DP mean itself, this value here, and information about the accuracy and the confidence level of the statistic. And then there's a, a lot of um, background information, information about the inputs, information about the data source, the library that was used to generate the statistic, and then general information about the, um, the concepts, the Go, that go into creating a differentially private statistic. So it's understandable by an end user. And in addition, there's a JSON file available that has all the information I showed you, but it also has information about the um, setup questions. So if you need to know that, that's available in your JSON file. So that's a super quick uh, demo about uh, how you can use DP Creator to create um, your DP statistic in, in, from within Dataverse. And just to go back to um, our slides. So here's um, an overview of the technology that we used in DP Creator. Um, on the development side, we do use Docker Compose to, uh, for all the different elements of our application, uh, as well as the Django development server. Our application is the Django on the server side. Um, we use Celery and Redis for um, async um, communication with the server. Um, our user interface is using the Vue.js framework with Vue by components and Postgres database. Uh, we use Cypress for testing um, and Python Django unit tests. And we use GitHub Actions for um, running those tests when we um, commit to GitHub. And um, in our deployment, we use uh, Docker, Kubernetes, and NG, NGX. And um, let's see, next slide. Um, so just to summarize, you've seen how um, we use DP Creator to increase access to restricted data that you might have in your dataverse. And you can think of DP statistics as like safe to share statistics because they don't reveal um, privacy um, about individuals. And uh, these use cases are for research depositories, as well as government agencies, as John mentioned, the census is using differential privacy. Um, you've seen so far um, in DB Creator uh, summary statistics, but we could also, we're thinking in the also in the future of using synthetic data sets, which are like um, the entire data set with noise added for privacy. Uh, so finally, oops, if you want to learn more, um, please um, 
use this link to go fill out your contact information and we'd be happy to talk to you more about differential privacy and how you can use DP Creator to create DP statistics for your Dataverse. Um, we're also this summer doing um, a lot of user testing to um, figure out how we can make a DP Creator more intuitive, how to make differential privacy and easier to understand for people who are not experts in the field. So if you are interested in helping us with user testing, we would really appreciate that. So uh, thanks very much. And uh, if you have any questions, let us know. Here's a question. Maybe one could also use this in blind data analysis as well. Oh yeah, that, so that, that's a good question. So our original plans are to have kind of uh, two modes of DP Creator. One is the data owner who actually can hold the data set and look at the real data. And the second one is for an analyst to come in. And we, we've talked about budget a lot. And uh, it's kind of, you can almost think about it as like, if you're going shopping and you have like a hundred dollars to spend, you could only, you know, kind of buy or, or, or get so many statistics before you leak privacy. So, so in our plan is kind of like the data owner gets part of, part of the budget to generate statistics. And then, you know, that data owner could also give some of the budget to an analyst who could generate their own statistics. But in, in, in that analyst would never see the actual data. Does that does that make sense? Or does that answer the question? We're happy to to go on. I I see there's a question from from uh, Sonia. It, it, so so differential privacy is tough to understand. Like uh, like she, she, Sonia wrote, the budget is still foreign to me. Um, I can let Ethan take a shot at trying to to or Ellen to ex explain it a little more. But um, it does take a little bit of training. So one of our one of our thoughts now is to have like. So, so like there definitely needs to be training before kind of jumping into DP Creator. It's not like an app that you can you know use on your phone while you're while you're taking the bus. Um, but uh, Ethan, do you want to say a little more about budget? Yeah, for for sure. It's it's a really good question, and that's definitely it's definitely a stumbling block that um, I've encountered in ex in explaining it before. Uh, I would think about it like if. In, in my classroom example, for, for example, if the teacher is releasing uh, the exam score, but is also releasing some other statistics about the students, um, I would say that budget would be like uh, how much you can release, how much noise you need to add in order to satisfy some privacy conditions. And you have a finite amount of noise that you can add. And every time you add some, it decreases your budget. That's if that if that helps and does not make it worse. Yeah, yeah. to the comment, the, the term budget is also used in other data privacy tools frameworks. Um, we're most familiar with it within our with our uh, within our own framework. But um, yes, it is, it is used in other ways. But 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 the way we use it is specific to differential privacy. Also want to say like a big thank you. We forgot we uh, we neglected in the beginning is like our work with the Dataverse team to, to do this integration. And we are using, just to mention, we're using the external tools framework right now. And uh, the Dataverse team is actually going to work on making it a little more secure. So with, with uh, signed URLs, meaning to use the external tools framework, you don't have to necessarily get an API token anymore. You can use these like secure URLs. Uh, Elena, if, if there's anything you want to mention about working with the external tools framework or the API, um, that's... Or if anyone has questions they want to they want to um, put into the chat, we're, we're happy to answer them. Here's one more. Can a data owner choose a preferred DP algorithm for his or her data sets? Oh, that's a good question. So I want to say yes, but wait two months or so. So so what happened? Like the as the Open DP library matures, it, it's actually a little ahead of DP. It's definitely ahead of DP Creator right now we're kind of adding like more, more functionality. So initially we want to start with like a kind of intro, introductory differential privacy or, or introductory users to, to differential privacy. But, but deeper in the library, you know, we, we kind of, um, we, we have information on the computation chain, which, which um, like uh, algorithms were, were used for each part of the analysis. So as, as our software matures, we can let users kind of dive into that a little more. And we do have like short-term plans to expose that also in that in that PDF file that, that's generated at the end. 
I also want to mention that we really, we generate like a JSON file and that's used to generate the PDF. So we kind of, so we, so this core bit of JSON information is also machine readable if, if you want to use it that way. Oh, question. Are there restrictions on yeah, the word French? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. That's a great question. If you want to take it, go ahead, yeah. Oh, is there, yeah. Um, so, so the question is, are there restrictions on where DP can be used, i.e. In, in certain countries? Um, it's a really great question. There, there is, a, there is this, this pending lawsuit about the census in the US. It's the only legal thing that I can really think of. Um, oh, good, a better answer than I can provide. Perfect. <laughs> For sure. Right, so, so to my knowledge, there is there is nothing, uh, there are no restrictions, at least in the US context, on where it can be used. Um, and, and my experience and knowledge tends to be more in private industry where it's being, it's being used and on a kind of consumer level, like Raman mentioned, um, sending data back to Microsoft, uh, for example. Yeah, I also mentioned that there's there's actually a weekly meeting right now called the, uh, it, it's it's a UN group called the Privacy Enhancing Techniques Group. So it's like the, the PETS lab, it's called. And basically it, it has um, members of national statistic or organizations, including the US Census, the equivalents in the UK, uh, Netherlands, Italy, and Canada. And they're all discussing it. So in, so in terms of legalization, it's funny because like the US is, is actually doing some pilot projects to, to almost like, make to sort of purposely challenge policy so they'll have to sit in the room with lawyers and kind of flesh it out so is it is it legal it it's i don't think it's really been been challenged in terms of restrictions i don't think it's been um completely fleshed out yet but people are using it and most of these like uh nso's or national statistical organizations i mentioned are definitely on board with with using it at, at this point so because yeah. because it has this like strong mathematical definition, it's really the implementation details that. that yeah, the, the thing that the, I mean, the thing that I would follow up on that with is that a lot of the current applications, at least in the in the context of like a a, a corporation, mm -hmm. is about things like getting user statistics to improve uh, products using DP. So that doesn't really touch on the legal side because that's an internal use thing. Uh, but what it when it when it becomes more uh, relevant legally and, and in terms of regulation is again in things like the census using it to uh, do population counts or something like that and then you end up with these questions of how does redistricting work so it's not necessarily the technology itself is like ban the 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 technique of adding noise to a st statistical distribution or doing some other sort of DP technique is inherently allowed or inherently illegal or banned or anything like that. It's more about what are the implications of using this technique on some sort of um, public facing data that has a political or societal implication, but for internal corporate use, it's, you know, it's yeah. becoming more and more popular. It's add on to the, 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 the privacy tools project with OpenDP, you know, it's been going on for many years and, and members of that project do include um, lawyers from both Harvard faculty as, as well as staff members from, from the law school who, who are, who've been consistently working on this. So we haven't seen, say, like if you use a differential, so the US, like a, there's a, a law called FERPA where you can't um, reveal students, if student information, including grades, et cetera. And uh, so there hasn't been a legal challenge in court yet, but there's definitely been uh, one differential privacy project in the last couple of years that's been able to kind of you know use statistics of, about um, student um, race and economic status etc and they were able to reveal statistics that, that weren't that weren't able to be revealed before because you could reverse engineer them so they were, they were revealed with uh, differential privacy and, and if you want to put your name or any notes in the uh, in the chat or or um, sorry in, in the Google Doc or fill out the uh, survey we're definitely happy happy to go more into these details. Okay, yeah, so we have about 15 minutes left in this session, so I think we need to let the last okay, right, presentation yeah, yeah. go. Thanks, thanks a lot for all the questions. And, yeah, thanks, uh, everyone. Please feel free to reach out. Okay. There are two questions in the Q&A section, so. Okay, we'll, 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 do it off, we'll do it offline. We'll, we'll answer those. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. thanks again, everyone. Okay, thank you. And our last uh, presentation,
is about building a research data archive. What flavor should it be? And it will be presented by Philip Komtse from Arctic University of Norway and Adil Hassan representing Sigma 2 project. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Sorry, I will be quick because I know last time I was uh, too slow. Uh, so, um, sorry, I think we still have half an hour for that matter. I'm not sure, but please go oh, on. Sorry about that. So you have lots of time. It's okay. Oh, okay. I, I will, I'll, I'll be quick anyway. I, I don't want to bore people. Um, my name is Adil Hassan. I'm uh, just going to report with Philip on the. Um, uh, on the work that we've been doing in in Norway for a uh, a new research uh, data archive, um, so the current data archive we have at the moment is um, about uh, uh, um, eight years uh, old, and uh, it's been uh, it's been running sort of full pelt. Um, we have about six hundred terabytes of data in there, um, and lots of. Uh, Lots of files. Um, throughout the uh, the course of um, uh, of running the archive, we've um, <clears throat> experienced um, uh, the users have, have pretty much grown up with the archive, um, and also uh, their needs have uh, have matured. And uh, we found that um, uh, there uh, not orthogonal, but there are differences between what we uh, thought when we started the uh, the archive and. Um, and what the use uh, the researchers actually need, uh, the software was uh, taken from a computational uh, biological sciences community in Norway, <clears throat> uh, and uh, and um, modified. Uh, so uh, one issue that we have at the moment is that um, people have moved on to uh, to new jobs, and so we have no uh, local expertise in the software. Um, and uh, the metadata that we have in our, uh, <coughs> excuse me, in our catalog doesn't really support um, quite a few of the features that the uh, researchers need, such as uh, collections of data sets. Uh, and also it's lacking in uh, fair data support and also support for op open science. So that kicked off the project uh, and the link is, uh, is in the slides to uh, where we are at the moment. Uh, the key findings from the uh, the, um, uh, the the um, concept phase of the project, it's being run as a, a Prince Two under the Prince Two framework, uh, are that um, essentially we have two types of users. We have um, users that are very familiar with uh, data management and users that are totally unfamiliar. Um, the ones that are familiar with uh, data management, they know what they're doing, and uh, uh, their time is valuable, so they're very often keen on uh, streamlining their data management processes. So, uh, what they would like is to have the uh, archive uh, part of the data management process integrated within their um, uh, within their uh, framework. Uh, so, they're very keen on uh, rich uh, APIs uh, to support this, uh, as well as. Um, uh, uh, support for uh, their domain specific uh, uh, metadata as well. <clears throat> uh, and the second bunch of users, uh, researchers that we have are um, uh, students and um, uh, professors uh, who are uh, very unfamiliar with uh, data management. Uh, uh, they need to archive their data because uh, uh, they're publishing uh, an article and uh, that's a requirement for. Uh, for publication, so uh, in in those cases, they're very keen on uh, on uh, being sort of guided uh, through the uh, the archiving process. So they're very keen on, for example, a, a web interface uh, with a sort of wizard-like approach to archiving data, and of course something that uh, doesn't take very much of their time um, uh, is uh, would be uh, very helpful. <clears throat> So uh, these two sets of users that we have, uh, our primary ones are the, um, the more mature um, uh, researchers that know um, mature in terms of uh, their data management um, uh, expertise. Uh, so they tend to have large volumes of data. 
uh, and um, their data they um, uh, they store on our um, uh, project area storage um, and they wish to to archive it. Um, what we were looking for was a solution that would uh, ideally uh, be able to easily integrate with their um, uh, their services uh, and uh, scale with the um, uh, the volumes of data that we we have and we're uh, sadly expecting in the in the not too distant future. Um, we looked around. Uh, we um, talked. Uh, uh, we're very grateful for uh, the uh, very useful discussions with the Dataverse community, the CCAN community, and Venio. Uh, some folks there, and also we talked to people that had set up um, uh, domain-specific archives, such as the uh, DKRZ uh, climate um, uh, archive. Uh, and um, what we found in uh, from our discussions was that um, there's no one uh, solution that provides everything that we need. Uh, there are uh, solutions that provide uh, bits and pieces that we need, and it would be nice to be able to uh, take out those bits and pieces and uh, and use them where we uh, where we uh, where we would like to. Uh, so what we've um, <clears throat> we've decided on is a uh, a uh, component-based uh, approach, and this is uh, also based on our uh, uh, Badir experience of running our uh, our current archive, where um, uh, ideally, uh, if one component fails, you um, you don't want it to bring the whole archive down. You want to be able to carry on and to uh, uh, to fix the, uh, the the piece that uh, uh, that fails, uh, and also, of course. Uh, that everything uh, changes. We're currently going through our third, no, sorry, fourth uh, iteration of uh, storage um, uh, migration, and um, which is, as, as most of you probably know, is not a, uh, uh, <laughs> not a, not, uh, it produces grey hairs, many grey hairs. So that's a uh, 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 interesting. So uh, thanks to Vidis. Uh, so this color is uh, pink. Pink, yes. And um, I'm sorry, I'm not color blind. It's just that I'm color ignorant. Uh, so this uh, NID storage uh, is split up. Uh, our NID uh, Norwegian uh, Research Data Archive storage is split up into uh, a project area uh, space and an, an archive uh, space. Uh, and uh, data is migrated from one part to the other. Uh, the amount of storage here is in petabytes, so many, many petabytes. I'm not sure exactly how much the new storage is, but um, it's 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 really significant. Uh, and uh, so what we were looking at is to have a component that would deal with the uh, data management, uh, a component that deal with the metadata management and uh, DOI uh, management, uh, and search and uh, discovery as well. <clears throat> um, so uh, that's the the approach that we're using to uh, uh, to um, try and um, uh, and produce the new and uh, the next archive. Uh, so we've gone through the concept phase and we're now approaching the um, planning phase of the archive. And uh, Flip has been very very. Uh, involved in the concept phase and is now, unfortunately for him, is going to be also involved in the planning phase and probably for the rest of it, poor Philip. So I hand it over to Philip to um, for the next slide. Yeah, thank you, Odil. Um, I have only a, just a few words to add here. So um, as you maybe, some of you have attended the GDCC session about the um, our discussions we have been having there about how to ensure that the Dataverse software and also associated tools and services are uh, maintained and developed in a sustainable way. Um, and as I have pointed out there in, in that session, there is the Dataverse, Dataverse community is, is growing uh, continuously uh, in numbers of uh, installations and also community members, as you see on the chart on the on the right hand side, which Phil posted on Slack the, the other week. Uh, this means also that the, the needs are uh, increasing and also feature requests. Uh, 
So we really need to make sure that the, also on the technical side, the way data was, the data software and the, the tools, the, the associated tools are, are designed uh, is kind of uh, scalable. So that the, the goal should be to avoid or at least to, to mitigate technical debt so that when we, we um, add new features or improve existing features, uh, that it's done in a way or the, the design allows to do this in a way that um, makes it possible to, to scale up. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Uh, so we have been starting kind of, or are going to start kind of more um, overarching dis discussions about uh, uh, sustainability. And as a first step, we, we um, sent out, uh, we created a, a community survey, which was uh, sent out in, in May. And the aim is to map to the, the roadmaps and priorities of, of the different dataverse installations around the world. Um, and in, in this survey, there is also a section about um, repository features, uh, which asks about the, the preference uh, of, of different architecture choices that the different installations would have for, for both existing features and also um, uh, possible new features. So here you see as, uh, just a, um, an extract of this uh, survey, which asks about the uh, large data support. So there are three main different three different um, kind of main architecture choices, which we ask about. And if you go to the next slide, uh, you see there is also some, some guidance on what we mean by the different choices and the, the pros and cons. And if you go to the last slides, so the idea is that the findings, uh, some of the findings we, we got from the, the Sigma, the Sigma 2 um, uh, archive upgrading project, which uh, Adil just has presented to you. Uh, and together with some of the, the results from this uh, community survey, this will both be a useful input to, to community discussions about how, how we can strengthen the sustainable development and maintenance of the, the database software and also the entire ecosystem of associated tools and services. Yeah, that's what I had to say from my side. Maybe there are some questions, uh, comments. Thank you, Dov. Um, I do not see anything being raised at the moment. Maybe I'm still considering something. Since we still have some time left, I uh, would like um, to ask all the remaining panelists uh, because some of them already left to reflect on a um, simple question uh, since you all are developers uh, developing tools and services uh, my question would be what um, you as developers what would be um, the improvements of Dataverse software that uh, would be most important in what you personally do, what would be the best improvement, most needed? So. Anybody can start. I, I can I can answer. Um, I think we mentioned that you know some updates to the external tools framework would, would help us quite a bit, and and that's actually underway. So I wanted to thank Dataverse for that. But another point which isn't maybe as crucial to our work, but we realized would would have helped us along was um, if Dataverse could be some kind of uh, authentication provider, like maybe an OAuth provider. So if you if you're working with external tools, it's easier to kind of have a a sign-in that's trusted with, with Dataverse. But overall, I would say that the Slack channel too has been fantastic for just kind of the, the connecting with the team and, and able to get like good answers. So I guess that with the remote work, it's it's really improved uh, our, our ability to kind of communicate and, and uh, work with Dataverse. Thank you. Anyone else would like to join in? 
add something. Yeah, so it seems that the uh, dataverse. Well, for me, I guess it's the, the things that, that I just mentioned about the sustainability and scalability, I think are very important in the long long run since the community is, is growing. So everything that makes the software and the associated services and integrations more sustainable, I think it would be good to focus on in, in addition to, of course, to always adding new, new functionality. I think the, for me that <clears throat> I would I will appreciate if we, if we could have a, an official image, Docker image, because the one I'm using currently uh, was developed for by a third party, and I'm considering considering creating my own, um, and maybe a, a more. Oh, I, I I know it's quite quite difficult to create a one stop. Stop, stop shop for for everything and a single solution for everyone but um a very very basic docker image that we could all elaborate on with some environment variables that we could also configure and set up and make it our own installation that would be a great addition to my toolkit Okay, Docker solution seems to be most popular one. <laughs> um, so if I can jump in on just some thoughts, um, improvements. Okay. Um, most of my are, are just sort of like technical in nature or sort of like, like the guts of Dataverse rather than um, user facing features, but um, I'll go through them quick. So um, I've heard uh, results from surveys that like people, users of open source software care a lot about security and stability. So um, we have to keep a focus on those two things. Uh, one of the security things that's coming up is that uh, Pyro 5 is going end of life. So we are actively working on uh, being able to move Dataverse installations to Pyro 6. Um, stability, I, I, I think if we should do um, browser-based tests, it would be a good priority, I think. We heard from, from Ellen that, that they're using Cypress, for example, in a DP creator to, um, to test the app. So I think some automation around that would be great. Stefan has mentioned, uh, he's written um, Selenium tests. I'm not too picky about what we use, but I think that would help overall with just the quality of the software. I'm a big, I'm a big, um, fan of documentation. Uh, I think the user guide in particular hasn't gotten a lot of attention lately. So it might, maybe it's due for a rewrite, but I would say it, that would go for all documentation. I've even thought maybe we should have some kind of a migration guide. We see a lot of people moving from Nestar and other systems, a lot of new functionality like a migration API, semantic API have been added recently. So that might help. Um, uh, people that are on different systems migrate to our software and our community. Um, I, I mentioned Docker and Kubernetes earlier. I think we should uh, just support more flexibility in how you deploy Dataverse. Again, we don't have a lot of in-house in experience with that. Uh, we could use help with that. Um, yeah, I, I, I wrote <laughs> get off JSF. I don't know. <laughs> but to me, that's just my pet peeve. It's just that the uh, framework that we use is not super popular. Um, I think it'd be cool to use something a standard from the from the browser itself, like web components. Um, but I'm open to that discussion. Um, a faster deployment for developers. It's uh, it's slow to deploy the war file locally. I'd love to to make that faster. Um, and then real quick on features, the one I wrote down was like, like sending more data to the data site would be great. We send just a minimal amount right now. And I know there are open issues about this. Like we send the title and the author um, description, I'm sure. But um, as part of the NIH GREI, the G-R-E-I grant, we are gonna be sending uh, sometime um, information about the funder and then the subject, stuff like that. But, but we should send much more, I think, just for discoverability. 
uh, thanks. That's my <laughs> thoughts on all that. Thank you, Philip. Very interesting. There are a lot of uh, comments in the chat about this. Uh, and um, I think we have one question. With the IPA, it would be possible to break out the front end from the back end. Adil, could you maybe ask the question yourself? Oh yeah, sure. Sorry, I I I didn't want to um, to jump in because I guess everybody can't uh, uh, can't speak. Um, but the um, I mean, what what we've seen with our archive is is the craziness that uh, if you make a uh, which is a Java based application, if you want to make a change to uh, a web page, then you have to redeploy the entire thing, uh, and that's. Um, that's a bit nuts. Um, if uh, one were to um, um, break out the front end from the back end, then you have a, uh, a separation of concerns. And it's, um, I think, as, as Philip was saying, if you're using uh, web components or some, <coughs> excuse me, uh, static page applications or something like this um, uh, for your uh, for the front end uh, components, then it would be easier to make changes to the front ends pages without having to redeploy uh, everything. Thank you. So. Yes, yeah, so there are a lot of suggestions. More. Uh, I don't know. If there are no more questions to the panelists, to developers, presenters, I think um, can we I can, just, yeah. I'm sorry, I, I just wanted to say one more thing. I think, um, uh, the, the, although this, I guess, is a technical session, but the um, uh, the really, uh, I, I mentioned it in the, in the comments, but the, the really the important, the secret source of all of this, why, um, uh, dataverse is is very good is because of the um um the support for archiving that people uh, uh people provide so uh, that's really uh i mean no it doesn't matter how good the software is um if you don't have that um then it's really uh, it's a problem so uh philip and uh and uh, edith and other people that do this it's, it's really valuable Here's a hand up, uh, Jose. Yes, speak up, please. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I was just I would just like to elaborate on on Philip's um, Philip's take on documentation and interoperability. Um, uh, I was thinking about what would be preferable. The Dataverse has, uh, fortunately, uh, a very active uh, community and um, and a lot of uh, of scripts and the tools that help uh, in uh, installation and, and customization of, of the software. My 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 question was re regarding to the to the documentation and, and these tools. For example. Uh, when implementing some scripts to to help to help on some uh, on, so, on some task what would be or what what would you think it would be the best approach to to put it in the main uh, so in the main uh, source code and then reference it on the documentation uh, if it's for example on a project like the the translations to have it on on that project and then reference it on the um, on the on the documentation also uh, what do you think would be the best approach uh, i'm not sure if that question was for me or not but um it I think was, was sorry. Point. But, sorry it was for you yes okay great <laughs> uh, as a starting point um there have been so many great projects, GitHub links uh, presented during this conference that 
again, as a starting point, I think we should at least collect them into the guides um, so we can find them again. Because I mean, <laughs> there's so much going on, it's hard to keep track of it. So um, I'm not sure if that helps, but um, I think, you know, it doesn't matter so much where the code lives sometimes. It's more just being aware that it's out there that, oh, I have to go over to this Git repo to, to pull in this this piece of code that I want to test or play with. So I'm not sure if that helps or not, but but I would just I guess I'm trying to say like let's at least start by gathering all the all the links and, and project ideas in, in the guides. Sure, but sorry. Um, the thing is that the, the community is, is doing in my opinion an awesome job with the, with all the, the running projects, but uh, most of them um, uh, are still experimental, so this would not uh, be on the official user guides or, or tools guides. So um, I'd like to hear some thoughts, if any, uh, about how to how to make this available available to the community to enhance the contributions from from other people. Right. Um, we, we have always linked to experimental stuff. I mean, we're, we're sort of a research software. <laughs> we're, you know, we're all into research software here, right? So um, I, we just flag things as experimental. Like uh, a long time ago, there was a, a puppet module for installing Dataverse, and it hasn't been updated in years, but we still link to it from the guides because maybe someone could use that as a starting point if they're into puppet. Um, in the developer guide, we have a link of related software, and in the API guide, we have a link. We have a, a list of, um, of like open source software that people can look at for reference. It's, it's organized by language, so I think at minimum, those are good places to link uh, all these various software projects. And, and we can put you know, the word experimental in there, or, or beta, or whatever helps people understand that that the author is interested in assistance and you know, you know this might eat your data, who knows? Um, it's just something to, to play around with perhaps. Uh, so we can put all those caveats in there. Okay, thank you. Sure. I don't see any more questions, nothing in the chat, uh, just uh, comments, answers, ex um, explanations for the information. So I'm happy that um, we have a live discussion on um, Dataverse software that I think everybody enjoys working with. Uh, so I would like to thank um, all the presenters, participants for their patience, especially the presenters for doing the same job twice so that more people can uh, uh, hear what they have to say, what uh, to see what they are doing. Um, also, I would like to thank all the organizers for um, their great work and um, I guess that's it we can uh, uh, proceed to um, break and uh, then uh, Dataverse community meeting will go on after a short break so thank you all